Yeah, right. As if I'm on a plane right now. I would love nothing more than to be jetting off to the Canary Islands to use a telescope on the top of a mountain. But there's a pandemic on and we're in lockdown again here in the UK. So we're still going to use that telescope, but we're going to do it remotely, 2020 style, but in 2021 <laughs> from the home office. So part of a scientist's job is to get data, right? Without data, you can't do any analysis and you can't draw any conclusions and you can't do any science. For me, as an astronomer or an astrophysicist, that data is observations that I take with telescopes. So observing the sky, in my case, galaxies, taking images or getting spectra, but we'll get to that in a minute. It is currently 6 p.m. on Thursday the 7th of January. Is that what day it is? I have no idea. Yeah, Thursday the 7th of January. Um, we are supposed to be observing tonight, tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday as well. It is currently raining in La Palma. <laughs> in the Canary Islands. It's also raining here as well, but because it's raining, it means we can't open the telescope. It's also really windy as well. They've had gusts of up to like 60, 70 miles an hour. And so that means that we can't open the dome on the telescope either to, you know, give it the telescope the little hole that it pokes through to see the sky because you'd be exposing that million dollar telescope and that million dollar piece of kit to the elements. And obviously if it's raining, it's also cloudy and you can't see through the clouds to actually see what you want to see. So I'm going to stay up till probably around 2 or 3 a.m. today anyway, because, you know, it might come clear, fingers crossed. It might not. It's probably more likely that it won't. But also, you know, I need to shift my body clock to working nights anyway. So if it doesn't come clear and we don't actually observe, then I'm probably going to watch Netflix's Bridgerton, which I'm very excited for. And having a nice face and pleasant hair is not an accomplishment. Do you know what is an accomplishment? <laughs> Attending university. And this is really annoying that it's wet because you don't get this time back. You don't get to make it up on a clear night. You get allocated the dates you get given. And if it's bad weather and you can't do observations, then sort of tough. Fingers crossed though for tomorrow night, Saturday and Sunday, and hopefully we get something then. So if we can actually open the telescope up at some point this weekend, we're hoping to observe 30 galaxies with bars. Bars are these long structures of stars and gas in flat disk galaxies. They're closely related to the sort of big, beautiful spiral shapes you see, but not all spiral galaxies have bars. And the big question is, you know, how does having a bar actually affect a galaxy? How does it change how the galaxy evolves? Now, one thing astronomers realized pretty early on is that a higher proportion of barred galaxies are redder in color than those without bars. Now, red colors means more older, cooler stars and not any of the sort of brand newly formed young, hotter stars, which means that these red galaxies, are they've been dubbed dead, right? They're kind of like a, a dormant volcano. They've stopped actively making more stars. And the question is why? So is the bar somehow responsible for that drop in star formation? Maybe the bar funnels gas away from the outskirts, you know, the gas that can be used to make more stars. Or does some other process stop stars from forming and then it makes it easier for a bar to form? And that's why we see so many of them in red galaxies. Now there's been lots of work done on this already, but the jury's still out on which one is actually going on. There's bits of evidence for that supports both ideas, but not enough to sort of concretely say this is what's going on in the majority of these galaxies. So with the observations that we're doing of these 30 galaxies, some with very strong bars, some with a little bit weaker bars, and some with no bars as a control sample, we're going to try and see if we can spot any of that gas flowing along the bar, being funneled away from the outskirts of the galaxy where lots of stars will be forming, and into the middle where it gets heated. If it's hot, it can't actually form more stars which is a little bit of a contradiction, I'll give you that, but it's because you need cold gas to make stars because if the gas has too much energy, it's too hot, it's moving around too much, then gravity is not going to have any effect on it when it tries to pull it together to collapse into a star. So if it's too hot, you're not going to be able to use it to make more stars. So if we can find evidence for gas flowing along the bar in these galaxies, i.e. being funneled to the center where it will essentially then be useful and can't be used to make more stars, then that would be the smoking gun to say bars are stopping stars from forming in galaxies. And we're going to compare what we find for the strongest of bars, the weakest of bars, and those galaxies with no bars as well, so we can work out what is actually going on. But I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, how in the universe do you even 
even manage to spot gas flowing along a bar. Well, this is the clever bit. Because the gas in galaxies is also surrounded by stars that are giving off a lot of light and a lot of energy. And if that energy impacts on that gas, it can actually cause it to glow. In different elements, so hydrogen or oxygen or nitrogen, glow with a very different and specific color or wavelength of light. So you see lots of these specific colors or wavelengths in what we call the spectrum of a galaxy. So if you take the light from a galaxy and split it through a prism into its component wavelengths, and then you make a trace for how much of each color or wavelength do you actually get, you see these big spikes, which are due to the gas in a galaxy glowing. So we have this like fingerprint of light that comes from just the gas in a galaxy. And you can compare that to the fingerprint of light that you get from stars instead and from the overall light in a galaxy. Now the overall light in a galaxy will have what we call a red shift, right? This is due to the fact that the universe is expanding. So because the universe is expanding, it looks to us from our perspective on earth as if that galaxy is moving away from us and we are stationary. But in reality, the space between between those two galaxies is stretching. So the light from that galaxy gets stretched on its way to us. And the amount that it's been stretched can tell us how far away that galaxy is as well. But that, oh, that galaxy overall will have what we call a systemic redshift. This overall shift in the light because it appears to us that the galaxy is moving. Now, if the gas is moving separately to that galaxy, it will have a different amount of shift. So if you can measure the difference in the amount of shift that the gas's fingerprint has compared to the star's fingerprint or the overall fingerprint of light that you get from a galaxy, then you can work out how fast that gas is moving and also in which direction as well, considering which direction the shift happens. If it's a, a red shift to longer wavelengths or a blue shift to shorter wavelengths. And so this is how we can tell that the gas might be being funneled along the bar. Assuming that we get some good weather in at least the next three nights, if not tonight on what was supposed to be our first night, then that's what we're hoping to measure and then analyze in the data that we get over the next few weeks. Now, everything I've just described to you, we also had to describe to the panel that decides who gets time on the telescopes. We had to do this in an application about six months ago, essentially to convince the panel to, that our science was worthwhile doing and that we thought it through. We knew what we were going to do with the telescope and knew what we were trying to detect and knew what we were trying to test in terms of a science hypothesis too. So thankfully they gave us the time and now here we are. Not, you know, actually at the observatory on a mountaintop, but all of us in our spare rooms in Oxford. But just to give you an idea of what it would have looked like if we could have gone, uh, this is me back in 2014 on my very first observing trip to this observatory, the Roque de los Muchachos Observatory uh, in La Palma in the Canary Islands. And I was using the exact same telescope we'll be using tonight, the Isaac Newton telescope, the INT. And I absolutely loved that trip. And it is kind of weird not being there, but it's also incredibly cool that you know, we can type in commands on our machines here in Oxford and know that a telescope halfway around the world will move to look at galaxies billions of light years away. Right? All right, it is now Friday at well, 26-ish. Um, uh, yeah, I'm wearing the same jumper as yesterday. It's lockdown. I'm not going to do more washing than necessary at the minute. So just, just give me this one. Um, we were hopeful that we'd be open tonight, we'd be able to be able to open the telescope dome because it sort of looked like it had stopped actually snowing. It wasn't raining, it was snowing today up on top of the mountain because it was so cold, it turns out. Uh, it stopped around about three, four o'clock this afternoon-ish. Um, and when that happens, you know, you think, okay, well, if the temperature drops, but it stops snowing, that could cause the, the clouds to sort of drop. And then on the top of the mountain, you'd at least be above the clouds and you'd be able to observe but that hasn't happened it started snowing again <laughs> and we've now heard from the person who's actually at the observatory the like support astronomer on site you know saying one there at a time for the covid restrictions and everything um and they don't think it's going to be possible to open the telescope tonight they actually say that the conditions are worse than they were yesterday and have been in previous days where it's been pretty bad 
There's also a weather warning out for La Palma and the Canary Islands tomorrow for very heavy rain, which is during the day. So, you know, maybe we could open the telescope at night time. But they've said that they are actually very, very doubtful that not only will we not be able to open the telescope tonight, but probably not Saturday or Sunday either. Which is not great because, I mean, that would mean no data. And no data is not something that I even want to consider at this point in time because you know, we did all the application, you know, we wrote that big application to get time. And if you get rained or snowed off in this case, you, you don't get reallocated time. That's it. That was your chance. And never mind, try again next year, which is not something we want to do. You know, the, the person that's been leading this is my PhD student. We want him to get data so that he can finish his, his PhD up, which has already been, you know, uh, disrupted by that pandemic. So it's, it's not been very lucky. Uh, to be honest. So I'm, I'm trying to hold out hope that, you know, it, it will come clear miraculously. Maybe we'll even be able to get a couple of hours in here or there, maybe with breaks in the clouds. But yeah, yeah fingers crossed, everybody. So just had some very frustrating news from the people who are actually at the telescope. It's currently Saturday afternoon like three o'clock or something and they've said that they we are not going to open the telescope dome tonight to observe it is so cold on top of the mountain that after all the snow has fallen the telescope dome has frozen shut <laughs> so even if it does clear up tonight they're not even going to attempt to even open the dome so we've come out on a walk because you thought it would be a good idea to walk out the frustration at the minute because it's just so frustrating that, yeah, all right, we're not getting any data, first of all, but, you know, fingers crossed for tomorrow anyway that we do get some data. Maybe we can open then. Weather will have to drastically change. But I'm also just really frustrated that I wanted to show you lot, like, what a realistic night was like for observing and remote observing during a pandemic. Um, and now I can't. And the, the funny thing is, though, like this is actually probably the most realistic <laughs> version of events I could give you because the amount of times that, you know, you do get nights when you want to observe and it turns out that the weather is terrible and you can't open. So it is kind of realistic. You know, we were tweeting about it yesterday. People were saying, you know, they'd had eight nights given to them on a telescope in Chile and they'd gone out over there and they'd ended up, you know, like three hours or something they opened the dome for in those whole eight nights. So it happens. It's just really really annoying wish it was snowing here <laughs> rather than snowing in La Palma but it's not it's just a bit gray and a bit dreary well I'm starting to feel like a broken record now because surprise surprise it's still snowing in La Palma and it's not even half four on Sunday and we've already heard from the support astronomer that they won't be opening the telescope tonight and we won't be getting any data essentially that like, bad weather procedures are in force you know like all the roads up to the observatory are shut because it's that bad this is like the tail end of storm philomena the one that's like brought 40 50 centimeters of snow to madrid for the first time in like 50 years this is what they're getting the back end of so i mean i shouldn't be surprised really but it i mean i'm just trying to keep my spirits up and i'm just laughing at like i remember there was an april fool's paper last year that was like if you ever want to reduce drought somewhere then give me telescope time i feel like i'm the equivalent now but with snow because i remember one of the first times i ever went to mauna kea to observe you know the telescopes on the top of Hawaii right the big island in Hawaii and the first time I went up there on my last night observing it snowed and we nearly got trapped up at the top of the telescope because it came down so thick and heavy overnight you know we were already up at the telescope observing and we had to shut around midnight and then you know put the ice chains on the car to try and drive back down it was it was crazy so apparently give me observing time on a telescope and it will snow I mean all jokes aside though uh <sighs> We're not gonna get any data now from this trip. It's, I mean, it doesn't mean that science won't happen. It just means this bit of science won't happen. And this bit of science was gonna be part of our PhD student's thesis, which is really, really frustrating. So, I mean, I guess I shouldn't write off the night yet. I mean, you never know, right? It could come clear and we could have even just a little bit of data by tomorrow morning, even if we just observed one galaxy. 
That would be awesome. I hope future Becky has some good news for you in the morning. Tomorrow. Nope. I don't know, maybe I was a bit naive for holding on to hope that maybe we, we would be able to open the telescope, you know, there was just some small part of me that thought that we'd get at least an hour or two of observations or something, but, you know, when the dome's frozen shut, the dome is frozen shut. I really wanted to show you guys though, like, what data that comes fresh off the telescope actually looks like. So I dug into all of my external hard drives and found the data that we took back in 2014. Now, these aren't barred galaxies, these are actually um, what we call AGN, so they're galaxies with growing black holes, but still, we were still taking the exact same thing. We were taking a spectra, which is where you put the slit along the galaxy, and then you end up with something that looks like this when it comes straight fresh off the telescope. Okay, so what you're seeing here, this bright line down the middle, is the actual galaxy. So the way you can think of this, because it is an image, but it's an image of a spectra where you've split the light into its component wavelengths. So along here down, I guess what you could call the y-axis is wavelengths. And then the x-axis here is sort of like space across the sky. It's like we've taken everything in the slit and sort of condensed it into one dimension. And so this bright stripe down the center is good because we've centered the telescope on the galaxy, great. But then you might be wondering, well, what are these bright lines that go across the image? Now they're across the entire space of the image and they appear at these very specific wavelengths. And so that is actually emission from gas in our own atmosphere. This is what we call sky lines. They are really annoying if you're an astronomer because they appear in all of your observations. And so you have to be very careful to remove them from all of your observations as well. It's essentially like a sky glow, like light that's refracted around the atmosphere, like sunlight can still hit into gas in our atmosphere at nighttime and cause those uh, gas elements to glow with their very specific colors or wavelength, which is why we only see them at very specific sort of stripes in wavelength across these images. It's a little bit too faint for you to see with your naked eye, but you know, uh, astrophotography and telescopes obviously pick it out nice and easily. And sometimes you even can see the specific colors or wavelengths of light that the, the gas in the atmosphere is giving off. But what we do when we're observing obviously is we wanna know whether we're actually getting enough signal from the galaxy to do the science that we want to do. Now, what we'd usually do is take an image like this or a spectra like this and we would clean it up. We'd remove all the sources of noise that we possibly know of, including, yes, the sky noise, but also noise in the detector itself, just from like warm electronics and things like that. But we don't always have, you know, the time or even the brain capacity when you're working nights to do that kind of in detailed level of cleanup. So what we usually do, if we'd been observing this weekend and we'd actually got data, we would have been sort of doing a very sort of quick, rough, sort of like dirty reduction of the data, sort of like quickly cleaning up these skylines. So essentially what we would have done is we would have taken um, sort of like a strip of the spectra down here, which just contained the sky. There will be some diffuse galaxy light that we can't see yet that will have like moved across the image, but mostly, so if you take a strip over here, it'll just contain sky and we'll take it off this middle bit, which contains sky and galaxy. So we'll just be left with Galaxy. And if you do that, I sort of wrote, you know, a really quick little function that can do that, then you end up with something that looks um, like this, right? And so what you can see is this, this is wavelength now on the X axis, but we've not calibrated it yet in terms of what wavelength or color it actually is. So we've just got it in terms of pixels. And then we've sort of got the number of photons that we detected in each pixel, like the number of counts. And you can see that what we're detecting now is just Galaxy. This big feature here is actually emission from hydrogen. And in this case, it's very broad because what we're looking at here is a growing black hole that's got hydrogen spiraling around it. So you've got some that's red shifted and some that's blue shifted. And so it's not this very sort of thin peak. It's this nice broad peak. So if we did actually get data of the barred galaxies, we'd be looking for something similar, but it would be across all of the emission of various different gases, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, everything. And we'd look for actually sort of an overall shift in comparison to sort of like the overall background galaxy light, which in this case is still very noisy because we haven't done a very 
tidy reduction of cleaning up of the data. We've just done it very roughly doing that sort of subtraction of the, the bit of the spectrum that just has sky and the bit of the spectrum that has galaxy and sky. But hopefully with that, you can see, you know, that's the kind of data that we're working with. We're working with these sort of two meter sized telescopes, these professional telescopes. And that would have been the kind of data that we would have been reducing over the next couple of weeks and analyzing and using it to test our hypothesis. But instead, we will probably be putting in another application in about two months time, the March deadline for the latter half of this year to do the same experiment, but possibly with different galaxies that are visible, maybe September time rather than January time. And fingers crossed that, you know, the panel that looks at these applications thinks our science is, is a good enough thing to test like the previous panel did. And they award us time again later in 2021. Fingers crossed all domes and the telescopes have frozen shut so even if it is clear tonight which isn't because it's still snowing apparently um we can't open the telescope up so i have made myself a hot chocolate we've lit a fire I'm just trying to make myself feel better because at the minute I'm very frustrated because we're not getting any data